Good afternoon to one and all. My topic is Indian summer monsoon and jet stream. Well, I just registered for PhD just for three months, so it's a very small work, very negligible, I mean, but then still. Okay, so we this week we have only learned about monsoon. Gatlinan gave a very good account what monsoon and how hypothesis and everything. And even we came across jet stream. So jet stream is nothing but just an arrow current of strong winds. So it's a combination, it is caused by a combination of plant's rotation, planet's rotation on its axis and atmospheric heating. So the two features of the Asian summer monsoon are the LLJ and property easterly jet. LLJ is low level jet and PEG is a property easterly jet. So LLJ now, it is usually the cold spell at 8.50 hectopascal and this is um, uh, during the summer monsoon and it's actually very important because it accounts for the half of the cross equatorial transfer of moisture. Now the experience is about 40 to 60 knots. Now this is the composite from June to September from, you know, for a period of 1948 to 2010. This shows the LNG. You can see the LNG pointing, see? Okay, now there's something called tropical easterly jet which is only found during your summer monsoon, Indian summer monsoon. Now it actually rises because during the Indian summer monsoon you have a Tibetan anticyclone formation and you have a sudden wind which comes around with down which has an easterly angular momentum and this accounts and this jet it has a speed of a jet and this is called a tropical easterly jet and it's found about 5 to 20 degree north and maximum speed about 40 to 50 meters per second. Now this shows you the LHA uh, for a period of 1948 to 2010. Now um, there have been studies which shows that it's been the trend of the monsoon circulation and from the past, during the past 50 years actually and uh, this is a plot of TEG. You can see the composite of TEG at 150 hectopascal, you can actually plot for 200 and 250, but the, plot, the maximum speed for TEG is found at 150 hectopascal. And first plot is from 1950 to 59, next one 1960 to 69, 70 to 79, and it's clearly evident, even the next span spatial, and even the intensity and it's decreasing. Speaking of TEGs, and this is for 80 to 89, 1999, and 2000, 2000, from 2000 to 2009. Now, what could be the reason you actually this uh, rise or rapid warming of equatorial Indian Ocean to see? So, this is uh, shows the 2000 2009 temperature at SST minus 950 to 59, which shows the rapid warming of the equatorial Indian Ocean. And uh, even monsoon depression is seen to decrease. Okay, so in the paper Abhishek in 2013, it was clearly shown this due to the rapid warming of the equatorial Indian Ocean, you have increased convection and increased upper tropospheric warming. And subsequently you have a cooling in the subtropics. So what is happening? There's a decrease in the upper tropospheric temperature gradient which results in weakening of TEG and monsoon hardly cells also weakens which results in the weakening of LLG. Now what has happened which is already mentioned before some uh, talks at all and monsoon cyclone formation, cyclogenesis is kind of increasing. What's the reason? TEG is decreasing. So what is the uh, condition for cyclogenesis? One of the condition is you need to have a low vertical shear. Only then your formation can grow. So this TEG actually provides a shear. So since during monsoon you have a high vertical shear, you don't find cyclogenesis. But now, these infectious weakening of TEG is occurring. So there may be chance of cyclogenesis. So I feel the jet streams are important because, yeah, it will be important because it will surely, if you know more about it, it will surely help in more better forecast and even understanding of monsoon. Less than okay, five minutes.
Yes, my research is it's a broad topic now, monsoon and jet stream. So right now, it's just been a coursework. So I just found as a TE sheet declining. So that's when I found it over here. And uh, so just started work, so just start to find more about jet streams. There's another jet stream which is called subtropical jet stream. And if you've heard about it, it's said that if it, only if a subtropical jet stream is seen to retract northward on set of us. And if it's seen the subtropical jet stream, if it takes delays of time to the northward movement, they may be delayed on set also. So maybe there are papers on STG and there are lots of papers, but still there's lots more to find. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Could you open this, my slide? Uh, good afternoon, myself Imran Azranke, I am from CSI and NPL. Uh, today uh, my discussion topic is physical chemical characterization of urban results. In this talk I will discuss only the part of my research topics because due to the time constraints. Uh, going forwards, I'll wait. Uh, this is the outlines, aerosols, overview, objectives, objective enablers, ongoing research, and conclusion future class. Yeah, uh, aerosols importance and what we intend to do. Aerosols are suspensions of liquid solid or in my way, multiple phase of condensed matter in the atmosphere with size and depth from 1 to 0.001 micron to 100 microns. Why aerosol is important? Because the formations and growth of the atmospheric aerosols have recently received increasing attention as the potential importance of affecting the climate and health. As you, should, as, as you, as you can see, when the aerosols uh, reach to the climatic, climatically relevant size, it will influence the Earth's radiative project and taking part in the power condensing equation. And regarding health effects, PPC depend, uh, depending on the size and the chemical composition, it can go to the different tract of the respiratory parts and it creates a different respiratory diseases. Uh, depending upon the source of origination, aerosols are two types. One is primary aerosols, those who are coming directly to the atmosphere, and secondary aerosols form in the atmosphere through the secondary region, maybe the photochemical oxidation or violence of gas to particle conversions. Uh, based on this, the objective is find the new particle formation events in Del Delhi and study the causes. That means inorganic causes, organic species. This study would help would be helpful to better understand the distribution of secondary aerosols and its burden over Delhi. If we going forward, uh, first we have to know what is new particle formation. This is basically the gas to particle number. In this cartoon figure, you can see the condensable vapor in the atmosphere contains to form a critical nucleus, which process is called the nucleus, the reverse process is called evaporation. And this critical nucleus, uh, depending on the suitability of the environment, that grows into the fine particles up to 50 nanometer particles. <coughs> and this fine reality can grow to the high particles by means of coagulations and condensations. And um, using scanning mobility particle size, uh, we get this three month of uh, experiment continuously, we found. See, at least the growth events, was, growth event was uh, growth of the particle uh, found consecutively up to four hours. It stayed there. And it is a, this, this is we call the banana figure. This is the particle size with respect to the length of the times. Here you can see the particle growth from uh, at, um, around 30 nanometer, it is just up to 160 nanometers. You can see this trend. And, if you uh, if calculate the geometrical mean diameter along this uh, size distribution with respect to times, if, uh, if you uh, if, if you can got the linear plot from this, uh, that the uh, y to dimensional c from the end, you can get the growth rate of the particle. Uh, and we average all these three, at three days uh, growth rate and compare with the people reported all over the world. Uh, when uh, New Delhi's growth rate was found about 15.4 nanometer. Or our for this three month of studies. And 
based on the observations we divide the days into growth event days and non event days uh, this is the 4th november data and this is the december 16th data you can see the distinct is between these two figures where the particle size consecutively grows into the larger one as a result the number concentration decreases maybe the conversion taking place with the particles that is why the number concentration decreases and in the non event day you can see that no such trend was found and depending upon the observations we divide the days into growth event days and non event days growth event days you can see the temperature was higher uh, in the growth event days and in non event days it was lower uh, regarding wind speed you can see the uh, wind speed was lower in growth event days and higher in non event days and we can see a specific trend uh, to distinguish the growth event day and non event days so we can say uh, temperatures high temperature and low wind speed Make the driving factor for the growth of the particles. If we see go for going forward, uh, if you are, I have did this analysis. Uh, what are the possibility of the growth in the atmosphere? Right. Uh, you can see particles of the same size coagulate to form a bigger one. That's the coagulation due to the cell coagulation. The phasely formed nucleus and particles being scattered by the existing larger particles. As a result, the larger particles act as a sieve and grow into the larger one. And this is the third possibility: the condenser will vapor in the atmosphere, condense on the surface of the particle, as a result, the particle will grow into the larger one. These are the three possibilities, and these are the corresponding uh, growth rate uh, calculations uh, formula by, by which we can estimate the growth rates. In our assumptions, when the absorbed particle suspended in the atmosphere, the total growth rate of the particle is the summation of growth rate due to the cell coagulation, growth rate due to the scavenging, and growth rate due to the condensation. And we estimated the total growth rate was 15.4 days. I have already seen so in the figure. And growth rate due to coagulation was found to be 3.79. Growth rate due to the scavenging was found to be 8 nanometer per hour. And growth rate due to the condensation was found to be 3.5 nanometer per hour. to validate all these mathematical formulations we have to have uh, the long data range for that uh, we have in some additional focus you can see that to find the mathematical formulation growth event in daily and study the gases like inorganic versus organic species we want to prove the correlation between water soluble organic compounds and the particle growth and the third one the input uh, impact of sulfur dioxide and of concentration variation on the new particle formation and growth this is the experimental setup we have and the simple setup we simply use the scanning mobility particle sizes and the, the pm1 sampler over here we run it parallelly and these are the recent observations what i found uh, uh this is the from december 2012 to april 2013 still we have lots of data due to time constraint and just putting five figure only here And here you can see the you can clearly see the growth of the particle, but no nucleation event was found uh, in this four months. But here in the April 2013, you can find that the nucleation rate part, uh, nucleation was occurs in the three consecutive days. And still it is there in the raw format data. If you going for the diffusion corrections along the tubing and the charge corrections, then you can have a clear cut picture how the nucleation is going up, right? Yeah, nucleation are you referring to cloud droplets or are you only aerosol particles? So only aerosols, right? Yeah. Aerosol particles. Oh, yeah, that is why it is in the 10 nanometer to up to 15 nanometer. You can see the nucleation. And in the conclusion part, our study suggests that polluted air and nasty air in New Delhi is much susceptible for new particle formation events and the successive growth of the particles. When major sources of the aerosols reported are regular emission and biomass burning. Our future plan is to long-term measurement of aerosol distributions and to be monitor the frequency of the events and thus to better model the distribution of secondary aerosols. Yeah, we develop a simple theory to estimate the growth rate of the object model due to cell coagulation, growth rate due to scavenging, and growth rate due to the condensation. This theory can be used to used on a set of simulations covering a wide range of atmospheric conditions in future. And thank thank you for this. Yeah.
and special thanks to the Dwecha Center for Climate Change and the instructors for their guidance, motivations and support to better understand the climate science. Thank you. climatic sciences and everything so so i'm today i'm just discussing about the land land oriented uh, uh, the research so we uh, so the so my topic is about soil erosion formation mapping parts of uh, single cell of the watershed so using remote sensing and gis technique so it's a case study so it's done by uh, me So as we all know, the soil is the soil is the major thing. As we just discussed everything about the environmental aspects like uh, ocean, aerosols, uh, other kinds. So the soil is also a very important aspect. So it's composed of particles of uh, broken rock that have been altered by chemical and environmental processes, and also it includes uh, includes uh, weathering and erosion. And also, it's the uh, major cause for the land degradation. And, uh, and we, by this land degradation, we can see the loss of topsoil. So the soil erosion is a major impact uh, to the human society. So the study area, uh, namely Zimbabwe watershed, uh, is located in Chikmagalur district in Karnataka. So it's a tributary of Badra River. So the watershed covers an area of 68.34 square kilometer. So the located is between uh, the mentioned geographical coordinates. Uh, the study area comes into the Gudrem National Park. It's in uh, Western Ghats. So the objectives of the study area are uh, first we create base map preparation. So using the survey of India logo sheets. So we used uh, uh, the the mentioned uh, so, sorry the we used uh, uh, by using this survey of Indian topo sheets we create thematic maps such as drainage land use land cover slope map soil map and geomorphology uh, and also we create uh, and, and also we update these thematic maps by using satellite imagery and uh, by integrating all these thematic maps we get the soil erosion donation map so this is my study area. So this is uh, the Chikmangu district, it's in Karnataka. So this is the western guy as you can see here. The western guy also comes in Chikmangu district. So this is the, uh, the location of my study area. So what are the materials I used is, um, the, I use survey of India topo map numbers uh, 48 0 by 3, 48 0 by 3 and uh, 0 4 0 8 and in the scale of 1 to 50,000. So to prepare the base map, and I used IRS S3 image to update the various thematic maps, and I used LRS imagination 9.2 to get the ground referencing, and also I uh, used arc map to plot the maps and uh, layout it, and also I just used arc map. So it's all about the GI. I did it in GIS platform. So the me uh, the methods what I use. What does Number mean map. So these are all topo sheets numbers. What is what is that? Forty-eight slash. Yeah, forty-eight o by three means. So uh, uh, we divide India in several grids. So we give the uh, different uh, grids, uh, uh, different numbers for grid, different grids. So the the series like one path. So if you get the for, forty-eight path, like forty-eight number, in that we get the O series of maps. Like O series of map number is three, and another number is four and eight, like that. So you can see in Isro, uh, Isro Bhuvan uh, uh, in this. Okay, and then, yeah. So I prepared all the maps, uh, getting uh, like suggested by IMSD guidelines. Uh, it's, uh, uh, this is slope, geomorphology, LLC, geology, and three model maps were uh, uh, prepared by using IMSD guidelines. 
and uh, I use it because to identify the soil erosion zonation uh, maps, which is we can find the broad areas which having more uh, soil erosion. And we later uh, we classify different uh, classes of uh, uh, attributes, and we get the uh, the suitable capability values. So this is the drainage map. So this is drainage map uh, because uh, most of all from other background, so they might have not seen it. So this is the drainage map uh, which is caused by uh, the rainfall, like the geological structures and and all the and other geomorphology, everything, every aspect they are all uh, create these uh, streams. So the, we find this, this is a tributary of uh, the Uttunga Bhadra river, this is the highest order stream, that is fifth order stream. So we can see here statistical information about the streams. So we get here in the first to fifth order, the order of streams is from first, first to fifth order. So the major streams we find here is fifth order stream. So this is the alliance map, that is land use land cover map, which is uh, um, derived from the, uh, the supervised classification of uh, satellite imageries. So we, uh, so the legend shows here. So this is the uh, area where we get the dense forest, and it's the open scrub forest, and the plantations here, and the settlements which are in black um, black words. So this is the statistical information of that LLC. So this is a slope map which is done manually using topo sheets and this is uh, uh, the, um, the slope in percentage and area in square kilometer. The slope which is having a higher elevation, we can uh, give the different uh, slope uh, probabilities. And this is soil map. We, we get here, we found majorly uh, four uh, soil, uh, soil types that is clay loam, sandy clay and sandy clay loam and also the sandy loam. We get major, uh, majorly the, the soil type is sandy clay loam. And this is hydrogeophilic map because it is having very uh, very elevated region so it, we get only negligible amount of petty plains like fly, plain, lay, plain lands and we get more structure this year. So this is the lithology map. We found major two types of rock types that is basalt, conglomerate, and metabasalt. These are all uh, from igneous rocks. So the the final and uh, uh, the last step is uh, we do in the English of these maps finally and we give capability values for it. So this is the uh, integration of all the map that is we use two maps to integrate and again the final map will be merged with other that is lithology, soil and LLC that is superimposition, superimposition of all the maps and we get the soil erosion zonation. So this is, these are the capability values we have given here. That is capability value is nothing but we give the capacity value like for individual area which is having 0 to 3 percent is having less weightage that, that is 1 then it is 2, 3, 4 like this we are given the capability weightage values so this so is higher value is uh, higher value yeah higher value is more weightage for lesser value we give less value so the soil erosion can actually be higher for higher yeah yeah so this is the final soil erosion zonation map so this is the, uh, we give, uh, we manually give the attributes, in the attributes we give the high, low, moderate, very high. We classify it like this and the output map will come like this. So the region which is having high erosion is in green color, low, moderate, very high. So this is the statistical information that we give, we have given area in square kilometer also and area in percentage. So what I conclude is that integration integration of thematic maps provide accurate information on soil erosion zones, and also it affects uh, uh, the development of human society. So we should uh, um, take care of it. And, uh, and and in the present study, dimension signal GIS tools are used to map uh, soil erosion prone zones, and also it's very reliable and simple one. So I recommend uh, uh, I recommend these. Uh, like we, I recommend these things to um, to other people whoever wants to maintain the soil So the, I prefer farming strategies and uh, uh, allow indigenous plants to grow along river banks, 
like and also tree shrubs and ground covers are also affected by the meter and also the construction of border check dams for civil engineering peoples. So these are also references which are referred. Thank you. So I thank uh, the nature center for climate change and also Bara sir uh, and also the organizing committee whoever uh, made me, uh, whoever giving me an opportunity to present to over here. Thank you. Can you go to the weight factor? Pardon? Can you say Yeah. Yes. You have given the settlement for the highest land. But yeah. the settlement is old piece or? No. This is the place of the... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But the settlements, what happens is they are not taking care of the drainages. So it holds the soil, but the drainages will be like, you know, it's flowing. The streams will be like that. The run for, run, runoff will be more. There's no infiltration. So I think. Okay, thanks. On what basis you have given this credit to the foreign parent and the land that you have considered? Yeah. On what basis or what part of what the world is thinking? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So uh, it's also uh, it's having one method that if we, uh, it's not like my, my method of doing this because everyone has done it. So I thought it's the best method to take a simpler format of uh, the soil region zonation map. Like, so we, can, we, can, we cannot spend lots of time like to do it and everything. So it's the best method to do early. Like, it's simple and dirty. Yeah, it's already done. So I have, uh, have mentioned the references, like in references I mentioned it. So then, uh, the potential value is the sum of these capacity Yeah. Okay, so we move on to the next question. So, good afternoon, all of you. Uh, as you all know, I'm the odd man from the slick. I'm totally from different background. I'm from communication background, so uh, you won't find any data and uh, you know that kind of stuff. What we do, like we use your data to just communicate with the people, right? So, uh, uh, from last two years, like I'm working on this uh, environment, environment issues, and especially on the water resources. So uh, actually, uh, my concern is like how these water resources are important for life and livelihood, and how this climate change is affecting. Okay. So uh, uh, I'll just so impact of climate change on water resources. Like we have different uh, like we have groundwater, we have river, and glaciers, and uh, uh, basically it is like how human activity, like uh, you, this science uh, science section has collected data and it shows like how uh, uh, it is, uh, uh, you know, it is uh, affecting, affecting that, that thing, like our carbon footprint and other thing. So we, uh, we just uh, document, like as a document, uh, documentation part is ours, so, you, you see the water resources central to life and livelihood. Mm, I have worked in this uh, Maharashtra. Uh, it is like uh, the area called uh, Ahmednagar district. Uh, it is uh, like there is problem of uh, rainfall and uh, this. So uh, these are the three main areas in which I am working. Like we are working Gujarat, Maharashtra and Rajasthan. I have already made a documentary like our team has made uh, in Maharashtra. This. Uh, I, the link I have given, okay, and that includes 
uh, about the problem they were having they started facing that problem just take it go and you know they uh, they went for adapting some uh, you know uh, some adaptation like how to uh, adapt in this changing climate uh, with the help of some organization like i have worked with uh, voter in pune so my my uh, presentation is totally based on experiences i have had uh, working with different organizations okay so like i have worked with voter and i have worked with c so uh that that documentary includes like how we uh, you know maintain the access of ground water uh, th this ground water is getting affected because there's no proper rainfall on time because of this climate change effect so this ground water is getting used uh, for agriculture and how this is how it is affecting that then the provision they have made some provision for drinking water like uh, one family should use how much water okay so like that so that it will get equally distributed then the water quality also gets affected okay and uh, then this it, it includes the, the that outsourcing of water and the provision of drinking water it is almost same uh, which these people are doing so this uh, basically this uh, uh, water resources are affecting like this health livelihood and socio cultural identity uh the my my concern is this health and uh, i'm about to cover this livelihood and other part uh at present i'm in machil pradesh and uh i'm working with the you know associated with the organization called sahavana uh, who are you know uh, helping the local community and you know the making people aware of you know it is totally different from science you know it comes under social science background so like how the this uh, the water of that particular region is uh, you know not utilized by them and this politics of water like it is going to delhi and that kind of stuff mm -hmm. then then this hydroelectric power plant is coming okay so that is how the main my topic is actually water but i came here to understand about this climate change uh, no the that relation between climate change and water resources okay and uh, like role of civil society we are what i learned here is like we we uh, how we measured the concentration like how we measure the concentration and uh, like you know up to what extent we can go but here we we think of the solution like what we supposed to do right so that is what the role of civil society like we should we should uh, you know decrease our carbon footprint what action we should take okay that kind of stuff so so this is what the link i have this documentary if you are interested you can go on this link okay this place it is covered in this particular region of amnagar district so that is what i have and yeah hopefully i i got too much information and i even actually it was difficult for me to understand all these issues i'm sure uh, what i understood is just 20 30% i don't know <laughs> so obviously i'll try to go in deep and you know i'll try to you know convey these things uh, with people here yeah. organization called voter they are working in some four five states like uh, chatisgarh maharashtra andhra pradesh or so uh, yeah the according to their documentation I and mean, that has been changed and we have interviewed what we do we talk to people we talk to the committee okay so we have got that that kind of stuff but i'm still in the process of understanding that whole scenario okay okay thank you Thank mm -hmm. you. 
धर्मेंद्र कुमार सिंह गुड आफ्टरनून एवरीवन आई एम देवेश मौर्य फ्रॉम एनआरसी हैदराबाद आई एम वर्किंग एज साइंटिस्ट एंड एटमॉस्फेयर एंड क्लाइमेट साइंस ग्रो From uh, past one year, I'm working on estimation of soil moisture using acid micro remote sensing data. The main objective of this project is to uh, develop a, a long-term database for uh, this uh, soil moisture, so that we can use that, this uh, data in uh, some global uh, climate change models. Uh, this is the overview of the whole presentation. First, the introduction to micro remote sensing and the passive micro uh, microwave theory. Then this uh, land parameter retrieval model, which we are, what we are using for uh, soil moisture estimation, then the results and the references. As you know, according to Planck's law, all body emits some uh, radiation at any temperature. This uh, black body uh, curve is for Earth. Uh, if we assume its uh, temperature to be 300 Kelvin, as you can, as you can see that uh, uh, this 0.15 to 30 centimeter is the passive microwave uh, range. So even at uh, that. Uh, Wavelength range, there are some uh, radiation due to uh, this temperature of the Earth. Uh, and this, this radiation we uh, use uh, to estimate soil moisture. Uh, there are basically two types of remote sensing, active and passive. Active is, uh, uh, act in active remote sensing, sensor creates their own electromagnetic radiation and uh, transmits it towards the surface, and the backscatter radiation with uh, we try to interpret, uh, interpret it with the geophysical properties of the surface. In uh, passive remote sensing uh, system, the EMR, that is electromagnetic radiation that is reflected from the, sur uh, from the, sur from the surface or if emitted from the surface, uh, we interpret it with the geophysical properties. The example of uh, passive remote sensing is uh, passive remote sensing. Passive remote sensor is a radiometer and uh, active remote sensor are radars. Then uh, why we need uh, soil moisture? Surface soil moisture is an important state variable uh, in uh, land surface hydrology and it is an important link between the land and the atmosphere. It influences the hydrological agricultural processes, runoff generation, drought development and many other processes. Uh, in initialization of uh, numerical weather prediction models and uh, seasonal climate change uh, models with the accurate soil moisture information improves their prediction skills. The image shows a, a sensor what we use to estimate soil moisture uh, uh, as an in-situ measurement. Then uh, in passive micro remote, uh, remote sensing, what we measure at the sensor level is uh, brightness temperature. This brightness temperature is uh, just a, uh, uh, is, it is a surface temperature into the emissivity of the surface. This emissivity depends on uh, two types of parameters. One is sensor parameter, and other one is uh, surface parameter. Sensor parameters include frequency, polarization, and low angle. Then uh, surface parameters, uh, su surface parameters include the surface temperature, roughness, texture, moisture, uh, which in turn, which in turn will affect the direct consumption of the soil, salinity of the soil, and the vegetation cover. Uh, in microwave uh, region, there is a huge contrast between the soil uh, dielectric constant of the soil and the water. Dielectric, of, dielectric constant of the soil is around 4 and of uh, water is around 80. So this huge contrast uh, made it possible to estimate soil moisture using a uh, micro remote sensing. Uh, this is a complete uh, LPRM model, which is what we are using to estimate soil moisture. I'm not going to discuss the methodology of the, the whole uh, model, but uh, the basic inputs are the soil texture and uh, the brightness temperature data. This brightness temperature data we are taking from AMSR2, which is a radiometer. Uh, we are using two uh, frequency channels. One is a uh, 10.65 gigahertz, and other one is a uh, 37 gigahertz. 37 gigahertz is for uh, just to estimate the surface temperature, which is a separately different model. This 10 gigahertz, uh, uh, 10 gigahertz. Uh, uh, brightness temperature we're using to estimate the microwave polarization different different index, uh, which uh, which will help us to uh, estimate the vegetation transmittivity. This MPDI is uh, defined as a uh, brightness temperature at uh, V polarization minus uh, at H polarization divided by V V plus H. Uh, this MPDI is sensitive towards. Uh, uh, 
water content of the plant and smaller the value of MPDI, the vegetation content is high. So uh, as we are using MPDI in a model to, uh, as an oxy variable for vegetation cover, so we did an exercise to, uh, just to show the correlation between the NDVI and MPDI. NDVI which is already a well-known uh, vegetation parameter. So what we did, uh, we, cho we, we choose the uh, NDVI from models and, uh, then, and then we try to correlate it with the MPDI at 10.65 uh, 10, uh, 10 gigahertz. This uh, curve shows the correlation between these two parameters uh, and the correlation coefficient is around uh, 0.883. Uh, uh, these are the uh, soil moisture uh, results. Uh, the first uh, figure is uh, just before the onset of the monsoon and the second one is uh, just after, after the onset of the monsoon. Uh, the resolution of this uh, product is uh, 0.25 degree and, uh, spatial resol uh, and the temporal resol resolution is uh, twice, twice a day. Uh, so as a validation ex exercise, uh, we try to find the uh, response of this, this uh, retrieved soil moisture with the rainfall. Uh, so we did uh, for the complete monsoon year, monsoon season, starting from May till September. First and first, uh, first curve is for Maharashtra, and second one is for uh, Uttar Pradesh. Uh, we took this uh, data from IMD. Then, uh, just to show the uh, importance of uh, passive micro remote sensing, we did an uh, uh, exercise like uh, we try to find the. Soil moisture condition during the recent cyclone uh, called uh, Cyclone Filene, which uh, which was uh, which had this uh, landfall on 11th October this year, uh, last year. So the first figure shows the track of the cyclone. Second one shows the satellite image of the cyclone. Third is the uh, complete study area. The this uh, bottom left figure is the uh, uh, response of the soil moisture and. Uh, it's uh, temporal uh, changes during the cyclone period and uh, the last figure is uh, the response of uh, soil moisture with the rainfall. Uh, we are still in the process of validating our product with the in situ data. So we are in talk with uh, Dr. Budhu uh, Shikhar of ISC for uh, validating our product. They have a site in Kabini Basin, uh, which uh, they are using for uh, validating the SMOS product. So uh, I think within uh, two, three months, uh, we, even we will be able to validate our product. Uh, that's uh, that's other references. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Hmm. Which region? Yeah. Uh, actually, this uh, 15th June is just the starting of the monsoon. So, and this first is before the onset of the monsoon. So the moisture is just building up, that's it. So even if we, uh, if you plot some later dates, like uh, 30th of June. July will be. Yeah, July will be a complete coverage of the moisture. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so the next question. Good afternoon, all of you. My Dhanya Kumar Singh from Lucknow Remote Sinking Center, Lucknow. My study, my work is temporal monitoring of snow cover and glaciation in Arwa Water, so Chamoni District, Uttarakhand, Himalaya, using remote sensing and GIS techniques. This is the tributary glacier of Lakhmanda River Basin in Uttarakhand. Yes, this is the introduction. Our water tank is in the Alaknanda River Basin, which is located in Chamuni district, Uttarakhand Himalaya. This uh, the Saraswati River touches the southeastern part of the Arva watershed, 
डायवर्सिटी एरिया इज कवर अंडर टोपोसिल टोपोसिल नंबर 53 एंड 53 एंड वाई 5 दिस इज द रेस्ट्रिक्टेड टोपोसिल ड्यू टू द बॉर्डर रीजन ऑफ चाइना मूसे दिस एरिया दिस इज द लैंडा रिवर डिस्ट्रिक्ट एंड दिस का सर्वोत्तम एंड अपर पार्ट ऑफ द चाइना फ्रॉम द दिस एरिया कंप्लीटेड द अरवा दिस इज द टेरिटरी रीजन ऑफ अलगंदा प्रोविंस सो The special extent uh, this area is restricted by the Survey of India to go see. So I cannot show the land land of this area. The Arwa water is just just upper Ganawal region. An angong the height of 6600 meter is lying between the Saraswati and Alaknanda water set. I put as as I told you see the upper boundary of Arwa water is is joining with Saraswati water set. And the lower boundary is touching the Alaknanda water set. The total area of water set is 190.72 square kilometer. The objective to learn the techniques of remote sensing and geographical information system that are used in observation of glaciers. To delineate the extent of Himalayan glacier covered area in Arwa water set and Galwal region of Himalaya. And to, the last the to monitor the variations in the extent of snow and glacier covered area during peak ablation period of different years in the Arwa watershed. So the methodology is adopted: preparation of base map through SOI topocide number 53 and Y5 and in the 150,000 scale and digitization of map and delineation of Arwa watershed area and subset by radar using software. Watershed area from satellite data using radar software. And the digital interpretation of satellite data for mapping the snow and glacier covered areas, and the mapping temporal variations in the peak ablation period month wise in the different year, and the preparation of different graphs, analysis of data, finalization of map, and preparation of technical report. The software R V Ten and Radar Nine Point One used there. Yes. You must see the first is the IIS PC list three data, and it is from 16 September 2007. The from June to October the peak ablation period of glaciers melting, but in this graph the area of snow cover is going to one thing. In the it is gradually not only in 2007, it is 2008 and 9 and 10 also respectively. Uh, so this is the seasonal snow cover area. Why it is it one thing? I don't know, but that it is requires the same depth temperature. This is in this depth satellite data is required. The same depth temperature and the same depth uh, precipitation in that region in this month. What is the concept? And uh, its uh, output is come to the. It is going to the sixty-eight point one nine. Uh, square kilometer in the 2007 and the uh, 9.584 2008 and respectively 1 136.96 in 2009 and uh, 151.56 square kilometer in 2010 so the conclusion is the in alaknanda river basin alwa watershed is monitored over the period of 4 years Through digital interpretation of multi-day satellite data, in conjunction of the Survey of India, Toposit, and uh, mm, multi-day satellite has helped in delineating snow cover and glacier area. These four areas, uh, IS data pertaining to years 2007, 8, 9, and 10, has been digitally interpreted to demarcate the snow and glacier cover areas. The analysis of snow cover and glacier area in Arwa watershed. So that are snow and glaciated area in square kilometer uh, on 16 September 2007 is 60.189 so respectively. This dimension to the that during the peak ablation period of the uh, of the years 2007 to 10, the area of snow covered glacier is gradually increasing and it is expected to the 36% in 2007, 50% in 2009, and 72 percent in. Uh, Uh, 2009 and 79 percent in 2010. The total area of our water set is covered with this. Any questions? <laughs> yes, thank you.
person. Good afternoon, everybody. Myself, Dharma Raju from Amra University. I am working under Dr. Sivi Naidu. Uh, I like to share a few of my uh, thoughts on the variability of uh, Tamil Mansur or India. Uh, as we all know that the Indian Tamil Mansur, uh, Tamil Mansur is very important. It contributes almost 70% of the Indian, uh, some 70 percent of the total rainfall. Uh, um, these are the data sets and the time period and the source regions which I had made use for my present study. Uh, this is the time series, uh, all India time, seri time series of all India summer months in rainfall graph. Uh, it's showing some fluctuations in order to uh, remove the fluctuations that had gone to the 21, year, 21 years running averages. <coughs> to check the uh, long term tendencies so it's showing uh, it is easy uh, for me to identify uh, long term and the uh, uh, increasing ten in increasing trend and the decreasing tendencies uh, those are the peaks which showing the increasing and the those are the uh, low lying peaks which showing the decreasing trend uh, <coughs> Uh, for my study, I had considered recent six, uh, recent six decades uh, data. Uh, this, are the, uh, this data is taken from the uh, in, uh, Indian uh, IMD, Indian Meteorological Department. Uh, this is a sub regional data. I had made uh, this. Uh, these are the rain, uh, this diagram representing the rainfall differences. Uh, uh, for the period 1983 to 2012 minus uh, 1953 to 1982, uh, out of 30 subdivisions which I had considered for my study, uh, several are showing the positive uh, positive values, uh, and rest of uh, them are showing the negative values. Uh, the minimum positive value is uh, Madhya Maharashtra; it is about uh, 7.9, and uh, maximum is uh, the sub Himalayan West Bengal, it is almost around 147.5 and Gansik West Bengal, it is about around 82.8, uh, This is the judge statistics for the uh, difference of mean summer monsoon rainfall. Uh, if the uh, judge value is around 1.65 or 1.96, the diff uh, the, uh, the the values are significant at uh, the uh, ten percent level and the five percent level. Uh, the significant values are around uh, one point nine, that is a uh, sub Himalayan West Bengal and the Gangetic West Bengal. It is about one point seven, and the negative values are uh, significant at uh, the um, East Rajasthan and uh, West Madhya Pradesh. Uh, this is a diagram representing the differences in the mean sea surface temperature in the summer monsoon season for the two weeks. Again, I had uh, uh, separated uh, the two samples, that is a recent sample minus the previous sample. Uh, uh, it shows that uh, uh, along the uh, southern latitude, uh, southern latitudes, the differences are positive. And uh, when we see uh, in the northern latitudes, uh, the differences are almost uh, less. So <coughs> this pattern clearly indicates that the uh, uh, this pattern clearly indicates that the uh, which is uh, the pattern clearly indicates that the it is not favorable for the mon summer monsoon. It is a uh, uh, high temperature differences. Uh, the differences are again positive. Uh, 
um, uh, positive again uh, the uh, the differences are less uh, along the one center of region uh, which clearly indicates that the temperature gradient is uh, uh, less these are the uh, journal wind uh, uh, journal wind circulation pattern uh, on the left panel uh, it is represent uh, the journal wind is at 850 mv uh, which representing that uh, in the southern latitudes the uh, the magnitude values are negative uh, almost it is, the magnitude values extended to minus 1 uh, which is uh, which clearly indicates that the uh, weakening of the south westerlies in the lower level and the right panel it is uh, upper uh, upper surface level at 150 millibar the easterlies are uh, uh, yeah, the easterly jet is clearly uh, decreasing uh, from finally what I can uh, what I can do is uh, uh, over the major part of the India, the summer monsoon rainfall has been decreasing in the recent three decades. The decrease is associated with the weakening of the westerlies in the lower lower level and weakening of the uh, easterlies in the upper level. And this is associated with the north-south temperature gradient in the Indian Indian Ocean region as well as its peripheries. Thank you. Decreasing. Present the gradient is decreasing. And why you see the difference in the Just uh, uh, 30 years is the sample for the climatology. That's fine, but uh, according to the data, the uh, standard view just. Oh, uh, yes, yes. Uh, 30, 30 years. Okay, thank you. Next question. So good afternoon, all of you. Uh, my name is Divya, and I'm working in National Center for Antarctic and Ocean Research. Today, I'll be talking on uh, recent variability uh, in the Atlantic water intrusion and the water masses in an Arctic fjord. So that picture depicts a fjord. A fjord is uh, geographically a long, uh, narrow inlet with uh, steep cliffs on both sides, and uh, the head is having the glacier and its mouth is connected to the open ocean. So this is my study region, Kongsfjorden. Uh, you can see a red rectangle over there on the top figure. So this Kongsfjorden is situated on the west coast of Spitsbergen uh, in the Svalbard archipelago. And this is a dynamically active region and uh, this Kongsfjorden uh, acts as a natural laboratory to study the climate signals as this gets affected by both Atlantic waters and the Arctic waters. This red color uh, curve that you see in that uh, represents the northernmost extent of North Atlantic current, that is the West Pittsburghian current, that is topographically shared to the continental uh, shelf. And the blue curve is uh, East Spitsbergen current, which uh, transports the Arctic waters. So there it is the Arctic water. So there is a clear friend in between, that dotted uh, black line, uh, friend in between these two warmer saline uh, North Atlantic waters and the uh, colder, fresher Arctic waters. And due to the uh, dynamical instabilities, barotropic instabilities, this Atlantic water gets intruded into the fjord through the subsurface. So the length of uh, my study area, the Kongsfjorden is 20 kilometer, with this uh, 4 to 10 kilometer and volume uh, is 29.4 kilometer cube and we have 16 CTD stations along the fjord 9 and across the fjord 7 and we have been doing the observations, CTD observations for the last 3 years from 2011 to 2013 during summer and fall seasons. 
So these are all uh, the water masses in Kongsfjorden uh, with the abbreviation and the characteristic temperature salinity of the respective water masses. These water masses uh, in red color are uh, found during summer season in the fjord. In the, uh, fjord. the surface water is mainly due to the melting of uh, glaciers and precipitation. Uh, this mixer that is transformed Atlantic water is due to the mixing of Atlantic waters and uh, the fjord waters inside and intermediate water is the mixing of the surface water and the water mass below it. Uh, sometimes it can be the tra uh, transformed Atlantic water and sometimes it will be the Atlantic waters. So first I would like to uh, describe the water mass variability along the fjord. Uh, the station 1 uh, in the left side of the uh, figure denotes the open ocean side and station 9 uh, right hand side right side uh, denotes the inner fjord so this is the city observation uh, for the year 2011 uh, the first panel is uh, for 22nd june then second one is august third is the uh, first week of september and fourth is uh, last of september so here I would like to draw your attention uh, to the Atlantic water intrusion. Uh, you can see two red color dotted uh, contours. Uh, the upper one uh, denotes the 34 PSU and the below one is 34.65 PSU. And the dark uh, black contour denotes 3 degrees Celsius isotherm. So this is uh, for delineating the water masses according to the uh, characteristics which I have uh, shown earlier in the table. So here we can see that the Atlantic waters get intruded into the fjord by the end of August and it, this uh, magnitude, uh, the strength in, and uh, the maximum amount uh, of Atlantic waters we can see in the fjord during 22nd September. That is uh, this red arrow denotes the Atlantic water. Is that uh, sir, this is the shaded region is the shaded portion is the temperature and the contours are uh, salinity. And these are uh, 2012 observations from June to October and here you can uh, see that the surface and intermediate water mass that is below it uh, have uh, warmed uh, prominently compared to 2011 and uh, this Atlantic water intrusions you can see uh, from 30th June onwards that uh, small uh, sphere which is below 150 degree in the second uh, panel. So the Atlantic water gets intruded earlier uh, than 2011 and a substantial amount of Atlantic waters is seen below 100 meters uh, by 3rd September. That is the below row, the first one, 3rd September you can see. And by uh, mid-September and uh, mid-October uh, the entire uh, fjord below 75 meters is filled with this warmer and saline Atlantic waters. And coming to the to, uh, year 2030, we can see again a warming, a more warming compared to 2011 and 12, uh, especially in the intermediate water mass and the Atlantic water mass. So here you can see that uh, the substantial amount of Atlantic waters is uh, seen during 7th August. So from 2011 to 2030, we can see that the Atlantic water is getting intruded. Uh, earlier. So this is these are the TS diagrams for the year 2011 to 13 and this clearly shows that the average temperature of uh, surface water mass, intermediate water mass and Atlantic water mass is increasing uh, substantially. The table uh, shows the average temperature, average maximum temperature in the fjord during 2011-12-13 uh, for the intermediate and Atlantic water masses. And subsequently we calculated the volume of fresh water in the fjord. Uh, this volume of fresh water uh, is calculated uh, taking the vertical boundary line as the 33 PSU isohaline and during summer this ice and snow melt is the uh, major contributors to this uh, fresh water. And we have seen that these uh, values denote uh, during the peak summer monsoon uh, month of August. And from 2011 to 13, this average volume of fresh water in the fjord is seen decreasing. And we have found that the decrease in 2012 is due to the pronounced 
increase in the surface water salinity and temperature compared to the previous year 2011 as we saw in the ts diagram and decrease in 2013 uh, was a combined effect of the increased surface outflow of the fresh water layer that compensated this increased inflow of atlantic water into the fjord and after that we have uh, checked the surface wind speed and direction at kongsfjorden and it again cemented our uh, uh, the description of uh, mean why the re uh, reduction in the volume of fresh water layer so this red rectangles denotes the summers of 2011 12 and 13 and there uh, the upper panel is the wind speed and the down panel it is the wind direction so you can see an increase in the wind speed uh, compared to 2011 2012 is uh, uh, you can see a increase wind speed again 2013 also you can see and the direction denotes uh, that the wind is becoming more and more southeast that is from southeast the uh, uh, so that the wind can uh, take mean uh, wind driven outflow of the surface fresh water layer can happen and we have checked the geostrophic uh, velocity also in this region it again supports uh, an outflow uh, from the fjord to the open ocean so to summarize the surface water mass intermediate water mass and atlantic water mass in the fjord is found warming and becoming more saline during the summer fall seasons from 2011 to 2013 the strength and volume of this atlantic water intrusion into the fjord also has increased substantially while the volume of surface fresh water in the fjord decreased from 2011 to 13 so this decrease in the volume uh, is due to the conservation that is to compensate uh, the increased and uh, flow of atlantic waters uh, the surface outflow also have increased hence the increase in the surface water salinity and temperature the increased surface outflow of the fresh water layer corresponding to the increase in volume of atlantic water inflow into the fjord this gets strengthened again by the increase southeast winds and these are the reasons for the decrease we have found in the fresh water volume inside the fjord and our future objective is to understand how much the surface waters from the fjord uh, the fresh water output uh, to the west spitsbergen current and its effect on the sea ice melting and related issues we have seen that uh, the even the surface water is becoming uh, warmer so the outflow of this warmer waters can enhance the sea ice melt thank you no questions okay. okay so we will move on thank you sir that's a very good talk thank you yeah this is huh yeah itra oh okay where is your card that is number 10 just click number 10 here Good afternoon to all of you. I am Gargi Gupta, doing MTech Remote Sensing from Vanasari Vidya Peeth. My presentation topic is uh, estimation of soil organic carbon using remote sensing in a tropical forest. Soil carbon when associated with a organic matter is called a soil organic uh, soil organic carbon. It's uh, it is most important for the overall health of a forest. Uh, Uh, it is uh, it having direct relationship with a crop pro uh, crop productivity soil type physical property and it uh, it increase the uh, water holding capacity of sandy soil when uh, when carbon uh, sorry carbon enter soil through the decomposition of the plants animal residual and living and dead uh, particles of micro microorganisms Study area for this paper. I am uh, taking is uh, Rantamon Tiger Reserve, which is in uh, Savai Madhopur, Karoli district of Rajasthan. Total area of Rantamon is thirteen hundred thirty four square kilometer, and uh, this is only one uh, tiger reserve uh, in Rajasthan where right now tiger is exist. Temperature of this area is for forty uh, degree Celsius to forty seven degree, and annual rainfall of this area is. 
800 800 mm this is my area data used uh, i am using uh, landsat tm uh, data set uh, special resolution is 30 meter methodology what i am done in uh, this uh, for uh, this paper uh, i am taking uh, my satellite data using supervised classification i am firstly making uh, lulc map for uh, getting information what is uh, in area that uh, particular area and uh, so i have uh, founding in this paper two things one is uh, correlation between the estimated soil carbon and uh, predicted soil carbon and second soil carbon map uh, using the land model equation estimated value is finding uh, through the uh, ground to the uh, in ground to the i am taking some uh, random sampling of soil uh, which is uh, in which i am done uh, laboratory analysis Uh, in laboratory analysis, I am finding some estimated soil carbon values, and secondly, predicted value. In predict, uh, predicted value, I am getting through the uh, remote sensing data and uh, some soil, uh, which I am taking uh, soil sample, which I am taking through the ground to the using those uh, these those th these data, I am uh, getting some uh, predicted soil carbon values. Uh, for this paper, I am using these indices, where soil indices. to find uh, to uh, uh, enhance the back, uh, background of the particular area for the soil and uh, second for uh, um, ndvi uh, it uh, it uh, it is used for the vegetation monitoring and crop uh, in, uh, in for this uh, indices i am using two bands nir and red and third one is soil carbon map uh, soil carbon from map uh, making using the linear equation uh, this linear equation come from the uh, regression analysis This is my sample data. Like this, I have uh, taken about only twenty-eight to thirty uh, data. Land use, land cover map, where soil index map, showing the uh, soil of uh, about this area. This is regression analysis uh, using a static analysis. I am uh, I am finding the correlation between the estimated and predicted value. What is the correlation between the these uh, values? And uh, here you are, you are showing that uh, keep uh, uh, R square determination of uh, coefficient value is very good, which is zero point eight one. So I'll carbon man high values goes to twenty one and low value uh, shows six. Uh, result is uh, this analysis is the determination of uh, coefficient value is 0.81 which is uh, so good and uh, the linear model shows the positive uh, correlation between the these values and uh, linear model is uh, good uh, here linear model is good for a carbon map actually right now this paper is not completed i am done uh, for, i'm doing uh, this analysis so that's it Okay, we proceed some other topic. You said that in your conclusion slide, linear model is the best. How many models do you try? What are other models you have tried? Sorry, sir. Conclusion slide. Did you try any other other than linear model? Did you try to fit that? Yes, yeah, sir. I tried, but uh, uh, I am not finding good. Actually, in uh, through the re uh, regression analysis, uh, which I have, equation I am used uh, through the, this uh, equation, I got a result. I finding good result. That I am not using another linear model. All right. Okay. Uh, so we move on to the next one. Next person. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, to everyone. I am Indra from Madurai Kamra University, and my topic is about aerosol cloud and rainfall interaction in a semi-urban region. Aerosols. Aerosols is nothing but a colliding suspension of solid or liquid particles in a gaseous form. For example, clouds. We can take clouds. Aerosols can originated from natural and anthropogenic. For uh, natural sources, example, sea salt, and for anthropogenic, we can take factory smoke, agricultural practices. 
There are two types of aerosols. One is primary and another one is secondary aerosols. Primary aerosols which are emitted directly from the source and secondary aerosols which are formed by primary aerosols and photochemical reactions. There are a few, uh, we can separate the size ranges of aerosols. One is icon mode. It is the size is between 0.01 to 0.1 micrometer and its residence time in the atmosphere is hours to days. And the another one is accumulation mode, which is ranges between 0.1 to 1 micrometer and its residence time is about two weeks. And the coarse mode particles, which is less than 1 micrometer and residence time is hours to days. And elusive nucleation mode, which is greater than 0.01 micrometer and its residence time is about a few minutes. And the site description of my work, it is Madurai. It located between 9 degree north and 78 degree east. It is about, uh, located above 100 meter mean sea level and the surface area is 52.8 km square. Uh, uh, from 2011 census, the population is about 3.2 million and the city resists major rainfall in post monsoon, especially in the October and November month. Materials and methods. For the study, we collected data from Moody's. For the study, I used aerosol optical depth, cloud optical depth, and cloud effective radius. The resolution is 0.25 into 25 degree, and the level 3 is recorded, and collection is 5.1 at 550 nanometer. And for rainfall data, we collected it from tropospheric rainfall mission. For the study, we used Mandel test, which is a non parametric test. It identifies the increase or decrease of a variable for a particular time. Uh, for the study, I collected data from 2001 to 2009. Since no trend was observed in from 2001 to 2009, but there is an increasing trend found in the last five years. This is the annual statistics of as optical depth from 2001 to 2009 for Madurai city. During 2001, the mean aerosols, lowest mean aerosols was found in 2001 and the highest level of aerosols were found in 2009. This is the seasonal variation graph. Uh, in the location, during monsoon period, highest level of AOD was found and during winter, the aerosol level was found to be low. And this is the aerosol rainfall interactions. As per the climate profile of India, uh, we selected it two years, one is 2008 and another one is 2009. The reason for selecting these two years is 2008 is active monsoon year and 2009 is the drought year, which is comes under severe category. And in this study, we particularly concentrated on post-monsoon period because Tamil Nadu receives its rainfall in post-monsoon. So that rain is the summer monsoon time or the What's it? That green line we have. This is monsoon. That is June, July, August. Ah, June, July, August, September. This is the monthly time series of rainfall over Madurai city. The lowest rainfall was noted in 2009, which is the drought year. This is the monthly variations of AOD and rainfall over Madurai. Here we, uh, in 2008, during post monsoon season, that is from October, November, and December, the aerosol concentration is increased with the increased level of rainfall. And, with, and in the 2009, in the drought year, the concentration of rainfall is increasing with low level of AOD. This is the monthly variation of aerosol optical depth and cloud optical depth over Madhuri. During 2008, in the monsoon, uh, in the post monsoon period, the aerosol is increases and the AOD also found to increases. And in 2009, the uh, there is a decrease in the AOD, whereas COD is increasing. And this is the variation of aerosol optical depth and cloud effective radius. During the post monsoon season, both AOD and COD are increasing level. And during 2009. Uh, AOD is increasing, uh, AO, sorry, AOD is decreasing, meanwhile C is found to be maximum. This is the variation of cloud optical depth and rainfall. In 2008, in the monsoon period, both cloud optical depth and rainfall was in maximum. But in 2009, the rainfall was in maximum, but the cloud optical depth is in minimum. So this is the rainfall and cloud effective variations. During 2008, uh, post monsoon, both rainfall and cloud effective radius was found in maximum. 
and in 2009 also both are found in maximum so from this study we found that there is a increased level of aerosol optical depth in the past 5 years the aerosol optical depth was found in monsoon and lois uh, found maximum in monsoon and found minimum in winter this is due to the boundary layer height and wind speed 2008 that is in monsoon period the aerosol optical depth cloud optical depth and cloud effective radius found positively correlated with rainfall and in drought year these parameters were negatively correlated with rainfall so the drought year uh, the negative correlation in 2009 this is maybe due to the absorbing aerosols which cause horizontal and vertical temperature variations as the system rainfall and another reason may be the less cloud effective radius which also leads to cloud dissipation and less rainfall they would have a significant impact on monsoon rainfall aod and cloud parameters play an important role in monsoon rainfall the increase in the increasing level of aod in this study site is due to transportation population and agriculture practices such as biofuel burning practices thank you Thank you. So good afternoon everyone. Myself Jivda, I am from NIT Warangal. Basically, I am working on uh, impact of climate change on extreme events. Now I am very much afraid to present these slides because because previously what men said that all the climatic model they are unable to predict the average monsoon rainfall. One thing is that the second thing is that I read so much of statistical downscaling paper. They have also predicted uh, this uh, mean monsoon rainfall. So now I am uh, attending to attempt to do some research on monsoon rainfall. Now I am in first uh, first semester of. So what I did previously that means my in my first semester now I am going to present. So basically what I did I took the mean rainfall. Actually, first of all, I want to introduce my objectives. Uh, these things that means predictor and predictor uh, because previously Mozumdar sir's class, I think everybody is clear about predictor and predictor. So no need to discuss about thing. And I use statistical downscaling. There are different types of downscaling methods like dynamic downscaling, statistical downscaling. Why I use statistical downscaling because uh, it takes less time to, for calculation. So I use this one and. I have used four models, and using those four models, I have calculated the best R square value. And taking that R square value, I predicted for the future. So downscaling is nothing but is a process to link between the large scale, uh, large scale variable and small scale variable. So what are the models I have taken? That is first thing, multiple linear regression. Why multiple? Why not linear regression? I will tell you later. Second thing is artificial neural network. Third thing is NFIS. This NFIS is nothing but the combination of artificial neural network and fuzzy logic. And fourth one is fuzzy clustering with linear regression. So what I did, I collected the data not from IMD. I collected data from District Development Office, Warangal, from 1962 to 2010. And this is my predictor data. And I my uh, myself used. The predicted data is specific specific humidity, mean sea level pressure, and 500 hp geo potential. Why I use this thing? When I read some journal paper uh, regarding statistical downscaling or climate change impact on water resource, some of the author they use a specific humidity, mean sea level pressure, and some of the author they use 500 hp geo potential height and specific humidity. What I did? I took all three in my case. So I downloaded those uh, reanalysis data like 20 NCB grid points. I'll show you later. And I use B1 scenario. When I read the IPCC report, I found that B1 scenario is the low emission scenario. So that we can assume that if we make less emission, so climate will be climate change. That is less effect on climate change. So we can see whether by using B1 scenario, whether we are seeing some variation in rainfall. In my study area or not? So this is my study area. So these are 20 grid points. 
and uh, first there are, i told you We are small Sir, actually this grid points I made by using uh, manually. So actually those uh, grid points I downloaded from the NCP data. Yeah, 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 divided into here. So look, these are 20 grid points, I have taken 3 variables. That means how many variables are there? There is 60 variables and I have taken from 1962 to uh, 2100. That means a large number of data and my variable is 60. So a large number of variables, this principal component analysis what you will do to reduce the number of variables and there is a co, there may be co-linearity uh, between the uh, predict, uh, predicted data. So to reduce those things also, we are using principal component analysis. Before principal component analysis, we have to do the bias correction. Normally what people they do, they subtract the mean and uh, divide the standard deviation. And after doing principal component analysis, I get two principal components which will uh, describe about 97% of uh, variance explained by these two principal components. So instead of taking so much of variable, now the predictor, I will take these two principal components. So the first model is multiple linear regression. Multiple means I have taken two predictors, that's why this one multiple. And I've I do, uh, I have done the linear regression and I find that actual value is very, very less, that is 18%. That means something non-linear thing is happening between predictor and predictor. Then next step, what I did? What are those two predictors? That is two principal components. Oh, two principal yeah. components. My predictor is rainfall. Oh. Then uh, next thing I move on to non-linear regression. PC is made up of what? What variables? <laughs> made up of all those 20 grid points multiplied by 3, 60 variables and the total year. Okay. So then I move, on, move towards nonlinear regression. This is I think as a feed forward back comparison algorithm. It's just like feed, uh, feedback like uh, in our climate system. What it will do, if uh, it will first uh, calculate your output and it will automatically calibrate with an original value and what are the areas then it will automatically adjust the weight and bias so this is known as feed forward back propagation algorithm this is normally used and uh, i have taken 80 percent of data as training data and 20 uh, percent as testing data after calculating this thing i found the r square value is slightly increasing that is 31 percent so my next model is adaptive neurophagy interface system so I have less time, so I quickly I'll go. So using this thing, uh, uh, there are seven, uh, you know what is neural network and fuzzy logic, there are seven types of membership function in NFIS. So I got uh, R square value like 31% in pi set membership function. And then the last model is fuzzy clustering, which uh, in fuzzy clustering, uh, what we will do, fuzzy clustering refers to the partitioning of the data, that means predicted data into the number of classes, that means 0 and 1. So what are the uh, predictor that will lie close to the 0, those have membership function 0 and close to the 1, they have the member, membership function 1. And in between 0 and 1, there are different types of membership function. All the membership will be fewer, that the summation will be 1, I will tell you later. For the following equations, what we will do, in fuzzy clustering there are a number of uh, uh, your clusters are there and their fuzzification parameter also there. So, I have taken this formula to optimize my number of cluster and fuzzification parameter to uh, uh, partition of uh, these principal components. So, uh, I have taken clusters 2, 3, 4, 5 and fuzzification parameter like 1.2 to 3. So, I did all the analysis like this is the main thing FPI uh, this is known as fuzziness performance index. If FPI value lies close to the 0 0.25, then you should take that cluster and that uh, fuzziness parameter. These are the formula. I have given the reference from where I got. And I found these are the board uh, uh, number of clusters 5, fuzziness parameter 2, number of cluster uh, 1.8, sorry, 4, and fuzziness parameter 1.8. Like this, I did. And uh, finally, I calculated for all the cluster fuzzification parameter. I found the after value is 78%, that is maximum for uh, clusters number 5 and uh, fuzzification parameter 
and after summarizing all those things, I got this uh, rainfall like uh, uh, so after doing fuzzy cluster stirring, I do the linear regression, I found this equation and I found that average annual monsoon rainfall, there is like very less, as we, we can say that almost no uh, climatic effect. We can uh, see better thing like uh, if we plot it like box plot. This is one. The first one is the 1908 to 2009. That is the historical data. And after 2010 to 2039, you can see that the uh, median like slightly decreasing. Not so much of climatic effect is there because I am using V1 scenarios. So these are the conclusion comparing Oscar value using different types of regression methods. I found that fuzzy clustering with linear regression is the best one and B1 scenario as I, as you know that low emission scenario so there is no uh, uh, much change in the uh, monsoon rainfall and you can see that in the future the monsoon rainfall is it for all India or only for my study area work degrees are only your grid point only grid point Great point means uh, I took that, uh, yeah, great point. Just for what I know. Yeah. And uh, the lower extreme values, you can see that in previous historical records, the lower extreme values, there is like 500, in between 500, 600. After, in the future, it will, if we follow the B1 scenario, then it will be like increased. It will go up to, in between 600 to 700. So these are the reference. Thank you. How many variables you have considered for your principle of analysis? 60, 20 grid points, 3 variables I have taken, 60 and your total number of years, 130 years. All those things you will do principal component analysis, you will get. Yeah. 20 degrees per each variable, number of variables, 60, then years. Matt Lab.